Now we will move on to study of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are very important class of primary metabolites, so they play a very important role in living organisms. We will start with an introduction to monosaccharides. Carbohydrates are a rather large class of compounds, and they are primary metabolites. Uh, besides carbohydrates, other primary metabolites are proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Primary metabolites are common to all the living organisms. Carbohydrates are actually the most abundant class of organic compounds on Earth. They are highly oxidated organic compounds, and they are named carbohydrates because most, although not all, most of them have this general formula, CnH2On. We don't use this formula anymore, but it was used in the past. And to early organic chemists, these compounds appeared to be hydrates of carbon. That they were compounds that contained carbon and water attached to them with various, for various numbers of N. And so, hence the name carbohydrates. Now we know that structure is rather different and uh, water is not part of their structure. So, for example, formula of glucose is today C6H12O6. That's how you'd write it today, but some of the early chemists would represent it as C6H2O6. As if it were composed of six atoms of carbon and six molecules of water. When we consider um, structure of organic compound of carbohydrates, uh, they are carbonyl compounds, which means they are aldehydes or ketones, with a large number of hydroxyl groups. Monosaccharides contain three to nine carbon atoms, with three to six being the most common. Seven, eight, and nine are relatively rare. Oligosaccharides are formed by linking together several monosaccharides, and they are often information-rich molecules. So they are used to store or carry information. Finally, polysaccharides are polymer of single or very few monosaccharides. When we consider their role in living organisms, uh, they serve as energy storage, fuels, or metabolic intermediates. Uh, they also form structural framework of nucleic acids, they are important structural elements in the cell walls of bacteria and plants, and when bonded to a protein and a lipid, they play a role in cell-cell communication and in interaction between cells. Phosphorylated sugars are very important reactive intermediates. They are high energy compounds and they are involved in metabolism. So phosphorylated sugars are generated as a result of a burning of um, various fuels, basically, usually uh, other carbohydrates and lipids, to give phosphorylated sugars, which are high energy compounds, and those are then converted further in metabolism in ATP. Complex carbohydrates are uh, Carbohydrates that are composed of monosaccharides that are joined one to another by forming oxygen glycosidic bonds. You will see later uh, what are glycosidic bonds. And so some of the important complex carbohydrates are disaccharides. Examples would be sucrose, lactose, maltose, cellobios, and polysaccharides. And some important polysaccharides are glycogen, starch, cellulose, and glucosaminoglycans. Monosaccharides are classified based on the number of carbon atoms. And main classes of monosaccharides are triosis, they have three carbon atoms, petrosis four, pentosis five, hexosis six. Those are the most common. Heptosis are relatively rare. Those with eight or nine carbon atoms are extremely rare. Another classification is based on the nature of the carbonyl group. So they are classified as either aldosis or ketosis. And we often combine the two to completely describe monosaccharide. So we may call something aldotriose or ketotriose or aldohexose or ketohexose. 
according to fischer rosanov convention, uh, all of the naturally occurring monosaccharides are D enantiomers. Actually, there are a few L, but almost all of them are D enantiomers. Uh, D configuration uh, refers to the configuration of the chiralitis center that is furthest away from the carbonyl group. So that means it's assigned the highest number by naming the monosaccharide. So if we draw a formula of a monosaccharide as Fischer projection, then the bottom chiralitis center, the lowest one in the formula, one next to CH2OH group, is going to determine whether monosaccharide is D or L. D enantiomer, natural occurring one, is shown on the top and has OH group on the right. L enantiomer, unnatural one, has OH group on the left. Triosis have three carbon atoms. The two naturally occurring uh, triosis are aldose, and that's D-glycer aldehyde, shown on the left. L-glycer aldehyde is unnatural. And dihydroxyacetone is a ketose, so it's ketotriose. It's also naturally occurring carbohydrate. They don't have much uh, biological importance, but they are interesting because DLL glyceraldehydes formed a basis for the original fischer rosanov convention. So all of the other monosaccharides, and not only monosaccharides, but other organic compounds are classified as D or L based on their relationship to D and L glyceraldehyde. Dihydroxyacetone is interesting because it's constituent of self-tanning lotions. It reacts with proteins, including skin proteins, to give dark products, and so it mimics tanning process without exposure to UV lights. Aldotetrosis have four carbon atoms, and aldotetrosis that are of interest to us are erythros and trios. Of course, there are four aldotetrosis. Uh, here, uh, only natural ones are shown. So D erythros and D trios. Uh, they form a basis for nomenclature of erythrotrio isomerism. So erythrotrio isomerism is named after these two carbohydrates. In Fischer projection, erythros has two hydroxyl groups on the same side and trios on the opposite sides. Of course, L enantiomers would be mirror images of the two shown here. Then we move on to aldopentosis. They have three chiralitis centers, and that means there are eight possible enantiomers, two to the power of three. Here are four naturally occurring aldopentosis. Of them, uh, D-ribose is important if you go from left to right. D-ribose is important because D-ribose and its derivative D2-deoxyribose are important constituents of ribonucleic and deoxyribonucleic acids. The other important aldopentose is D-xylose because it's the second most abundant monosaccharide in nature. The most abundant is glucose. And at this point, you can see that representing uh, monosaccharides as Fischer projections takes up a lot of space and takes a bit of time to draw all of these substituents, H and OH groups. And we know general structures, so drawing all of them doesn't add that much to information. So we have actually stick formulas. These are rather interesting stick formulas that are stylized Fischer projections. In a stick formula, we have head that represents aldehyde functional group. So that head means CHO group. And then body of carbon atoms, chain of carbon atoms is shown as straight chain, straight line, and hydroxyl groups are represented as solid lines. So they point to the left or to the right, depending where they are in Fischer projection. The last one is CH2OH group. So wherever horizontal line meets vertical line, there is a carbon atom and on the other side there is hydrogen atom. The bottom one, the bottom point, is CH2OH group. So uh, the four aldopentoses that are represented by Fischer projections on the top are shown below as stick formulas. And finally, under physiological conditions, in aqueous solution, pentoses form rings. They exist mainly in cyclic forms. And to represent them, we use Hayward projection formulas. Hayward projection formulas are designed to represent stereochemistry properly, so that we can identify easily stereochemistry of individual ring, not its conformation. And for that reason, 
Favored projection formula represents rings in least stable planar conformation. Remember that the least stable conformation is usually the most symmetrical one, and that's the one that is the best to examine stereochemistry of a compound. So it's not the most stable conformation that we are looking at, but we are looking at the, the least stable, the most symmetrical conformation, and it's shown here as flat ring under an angle. And again, four of the aldopentoses shown above are shown here in their cyclic forms. If you wish, we can stop the video here and examine them in more detail. Besides aldopentoses, there are some ketopentoses that are important. And those that are interesting, there are actually two of them, because ketopentoses have only two chirality centers. That means that there are a total of four different ketopentoses and, that, and in turn only two naturally occurring, and only two naturally occurring D enantiomers, D ribulose and D xylulose. Uh, ribulose is interesting because ribulose 1 for bisphosphate is involved in photosynthesis. You can notice that both of them are two ketopentoses. Three ketopentoses are very rare. And note that when they form rings, they form additional chirality center. We'll examine that in more detail later, called anomeric carbon. So there are a total of four cyclic forms, two for D -rib uh, rib ribulose, it's called ribio ribulofuranose, alpha and beta form, depending on where hydroxyl group, newly formed hydroxyl group is. If it's below the plane of the ring, that's alpha form. If it's above the plane of the ring, beta form. And two xylulofuranoses, again alpha and beta. And aldohexose has four chirality centers. And that means that there are 16 possible stereoisomers to the power of 4, 16. Eight naturally occurring are shown here. I won't be going through all of them. I'll point only some more interesting ones. So glucose in the top row, third from the left, is the most important and the most abundant monosaccharide in nature. Next to it is mannose, also very important. Galactose is important. But as you can see, there are eight of them, and each of them has its own name. In aqueous solution, monosaccharides exist in cyclic forms. And when we get to hexosis, aldohexosis, they could form two types of rings, five-membered ring and six-membered ring. Six-membered rings are considered to be derivatives of pyran, and so they are called pyranoses. Pyran is shown here. Five-membered rings, we have already seen them in the previous uh, discussion of aldopentosis and uh, ketopentosis, are considered to be derivatives of furan, and they are called furanoses. The most important and the most abundant monosaccharide is glucose, and it exists in form of pyranose. Two furanose forms are present in very low amount, only about 1%. So most of the uh, glucose, as shown here, exists. Uh, it's shown here as 100%, but exists in form of two isomeric uh, pyranoses. Now, next phenomenon is mutarotation of glucose, and the glucose can crystallize out of aqueous solution as either pure alpha pyranose or pure beta pyranose. But in the course of crystallization, new chirality center is formed, and it's indicated here by an asterisk in formulas above or by a number one in formula below under mutation, mutarotation of glucose. This new chirality center is called anomeric carbon. That's anomeric carbon, and two uh, isomers are called anomers. So alpha pyranose and beta pyranose forms of glucose are two anomers of each other. They can be easily identified because they have different specific rotations, plus 112.2 for alpha glucopyranose and plus 18.7 for beta glucopyranose. When they are dissolved in water, if you start with either enantiomer, with pure uh, solution of either enantiomer, 
they very quickly equilibrate to give equilibri equilibrium mixture, which is composed of 64% of beta glucopyranose and 36% of alpha glucopyranose. A change in specific rotation as a result of mutarotation and reaching an equilibrium is called mutarotation of the glucose. And here is the mechanism. So uh, one particular pyranose form opens to give an open chain, D-glucose, which then can cyclize to either alpha or beta form, alpha or beta pyranose form, or it could also uh, cyclize into furanose forms, although those are rare. As I already mentioned, they constitute only about 1% of glucose. And so uh, when left on its own, D-glucose will cyclize to give 64% of beta isomer where OH group on anomeric carbon indicated by an asterisk or number one is up above the plane of the ring and 36% of alpha form where that hydroxyl group is below the plane of the ring. Now we should look a little bit into epimers and anomers. So two diastereomers that differ in configuration at a single karate center, it doesn't matter which one, just if they have more than one karate center, so they have multiple karate centers, at least two, and they differ in configuration of only single karate center, configuration of other karate centers is identical, then they are epimers of each other. Numerous monosaccharides are epimers of each other, and here are some examples. D-ribose and D-arabinose are epimers of each other, and karate centers that are different are indicated in red. Same goes for D-glucose and D-galactose, also two epimers of each other, and again, karate centers that differ from each other are shown in red. Now, when a monosaccharide cyclizes into pyranose or furanose form, then new karate center is formed, and in aldosis, this karate center is at C1. So that old carbon that used to be carbonyl carbon now forms chemiacetal, has four different substituents, and is new karate center. So that carbon is called anomeric carbon. And isomers that differ only in configuration of the anomeric carbon are called anomers. So anomers are derivative of the same monosaccharide. So alpha and beta forms of particular monosaccharide are two anomers. Here we have examples of two anomers of glucose, alpha and beta pyranose forms of glucose or two anomers of each other. When we consider two anomers of glucose, you can see that alpha form on the left has an anomeric hydroxyl group, that one attached to an anomeric carbon, in axial uh, position, while beta form, one on the right, has all the substituents all five substituents in equatorial positions. As you may recall from organic chemistry, chemistry course, in a cyclohexane, substituent in equatorial position doesn't cause any strain, any steric strain, and cyclohexane is more stable if all of the substituents are in equatorial positions. Less stable conformation is one that has axial substituents. In this case, we have unexpectedly large amount of less stable alpha anomer, 36% of anomer where hydroxyl group is in axial position. And then if we react glucose with, for example, methanol to form a gly glycoside, so compounds where anomeric hydroxyl group, hemiacetal group reacts with an alcohol with some other OH group, some uh, basically alcohol or compound contains an OH group, it could be more complex than just an alcohol, then uh, product is called glucoside. And uh, this is a glycosidic bond. So when we uh, prepare a glycoside, a, a methyl glycoside of glucose, then actually uh, alpha form predominates. We have 33% of beta isomer and 67% of, of uh, alpha isomer. And so this preference of alkoxy substituent for axial position is called anomeric effect, or in general, an expected large amount of alpha or axial hydroxyl group. Uh, alpha is not always axial, but in this case it is, uh, depending on the carbohydrate and conformation. 
uh, but in this case alpha is so unexpectedly large reference for axial or large amount of axial isomer is called anomeric effect there are different explanations for anomeric effect you only need to know that uh, this is uh, axial isomer and we obtain unexpectedly or glucose exists uh, in uh, unexpectedly large amount of isomer that has axial hydroxyl group axial anomeric hydroxyl group When we consider ketohexosis, the most important one is fructose. That one has carbonyl group on carbon 2. So just like ketopentosis, uh, most of the naturally occurring ketohexosis are 2 ketohexosis. 3 ketohexosis or 4 ketohexosis would be very rare. Fructose exists in cyclic forms and it exists 80% in form of pyranose and about 20% furanols. There are two other well-known ketohexosis, and they are tagatose and sorbose. Tagatose is used in low-calorie replacement for sucrose, while sorbose is naturally occurring starting material for production of ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Most of the vitamin C that is commercially available is synthetically produced. And this cycles, which is also called the allulose, is ultra low energy ketohexose. Uh, but it is rare sugar because it rarely occurs in nature and is available only in small amounts. This cycles is interesting because it yields only 0.3% of metabolic energy of the equivalent amount of sucrose. And so uh, if it's available in significant amount, it could be useful low calorie sweetener. And what is interesting here are stick formulas, geofructose, tagatose, sorbose, and cycles. So compare them to Fisher projections. You can see that now we represent carbonyl group, keto group, as a line formula, and rest is the same. Terminal CH2OH groups, primary alcohol, is stone, shown as end of this straight chain, vertical chain, and individual hydroxyl groups as substituents are shown as horizontal lines pointing to the left or right, wherever position of the corresponding hydroxyl group is. Finally, we are going to examine how to convert Fisher into Hayward projection. So we start with a Fisher projection and we need to know, for example, in the case of a hexose, which bond is being formed. So whether a bond uh, is being formed, ring bond that forms a ring, forms a five or six membered ring. So whether bond is being formed between carbonyl carbon and hydroxyl carbon on carbon 4 or carbon 5 of the chain. If five-membered ring, furanose is formed, that bond is formed between carbon 1 and hydroxyl group 4. If pyranose ring is formed, which is shown here, bond is being formed between carbon 1, carbonyl carbon, aldehyde carbon, and hydroxyl group 5. And so we draw that bond as long curved bond. We simply want to indicate which bond is being formed. And then rotate that molecule 90 degrees as the first step towards obtaining Hayward projection. Now remember, this is a Fisher projection. And in Fisher projection, if you recall, horizontal bonds in the original Fisher projection point towards us. Bonds in the straight chain, vertical chain, are in the plane of the drawing, except for the terminal bonds, top and bottom one, the top most of one and bottom lowest one, uh, those are behind the plane of the drawing. So now that we rotated Fisher projection 90 degrees, we should show these bonds as a wedge and dash bonds. So now uh, vertical bonds will actually project towards us and terminal horizontal bonds away from us. So opposite from Fisher convention, but remember we rotated Fisher projection by 90 degrees. And then next we want to redraw that as, we, so we want to first place oxygen carbon bond. Um, this is now shown as oxygen six because it's going to be atom six in a ring. In a ring. We want to show that is as Hayward projection. So we draw six membered ring 
number carbon atoms 1 through 5, the last carbon atom 6 is going to be substituent on the ring, and oxygen is atom 6 of the ring. So we draw Hayward projection, and now we consider each atom, atom 1, and so we consider where OH group is. Is it up or down on the atom 1? Now that's actually a numeric carbon, so that OH group could be either up or down, depending on whether anomer is alpha, as shown here, or beta, then OH group would be up. And then on carbon 2, we see that OH group points up, so in Hayward projection, it's also going to be up above the ring. Carbon 3 also up. Carbon 4, that hydroxyl group points down, so on the ring, it's going to be down, below plane of the ring. And finally, primary alcohol group, CH2OH, points up, so it's going to be above the plane of the ring. Here is, it's shown another way, with uh, bonds of the ring being colored. To show more easily so that you can more easily follow this process. And one more time with uh, all the bonds being colored, bonds in the original Fisher projection and then 90 degrees rotation and finally in the ring of Hayward projection. And of course you can pause the video here and examine this more in detail and I would suggest that you practice drawing this and practice converting Fisher projection of various carbohydrates, various monosaccharides into Hayward projections. So this completes introduction into monosaccharides.